Hey everyone, it's Chuck Arfine, and this is the White Sox Talk Podcast brought to you by Wintrust. Wednesday night, the White Sox with their first round pick shows a six foot six fireballer from Tennessee who has been compared to a pitcher by the name of Chris Sale. I'll take that. So what are the White Sox getting in Garrett Crochet? And why did they draft him? We'll talk about that. Plus, should they have taken Ed Howard instead? Came up through the ace program, Chicago kid, and later went to the Cubs. What do we think about that? And did I bury the lead? Rob Manfred, commissioner of baseball, says there will be baseball 100% in 2020. We got that and more on a busy White Sox Talk podcast. Let's do it. White Sox, White Sox, go, go, White Sox. That ball hit deep, way back. Deep to the field. Holy cow. Carlton Fest has put the White Sox ahead. Jimenez leaves the ballpark. You can put it on the board. Yes. We got a chance to do something real special. All right, sit back, relax, and strap it down. It's time for the White Sox Talk Podcast. Okay, we got Adam Ho, Ryan McGuffey, and Vinny Duber here to break it all down. This is Mike Shirley's first draft as amateur scouting director, guys. What did you think of who he chose first in Garrett Crochet? Ryan McGuffey, let's start with you. I mean... Certainly like the cops. I mean, I, it's hard. Like, you get excited. I, this is, like, the one night you get excited about a guy, it's, like, especially in the mid – I call it the 11th pick almost kind of, like, mid-round because it's most uh, – these guys kind of go away for a few years after that. I, we've spent so much time the last three and a half, four years looking and dissecting at every possible draft pick and every prospect the White Sox have had, and he fits nicely into there. You got to love that the cops are Chris Sale. Now, that would that would be like a steal at that point if it's Chris Sale. But anytime you're getting a left handed a left hander with a fastball that can top out at a hundred, sign me up. Like that's that's I love that a guy who's going to throw heat from the left side with a wipeout slider. I'll push my chips in at the eleventh pick and hope at the worst that he's pitching out of your bullpen someday. That that's why guys I like what the White Sox did here because. Golf, like you said, I mean, we get excited about these guys on draft night, and then they go off to the minors for a couple of years. Sometimes you forget about them. They have problems. They get hurt. I mean, you know, we've seen what's happened to Jake Berger, for instance. This seems different with Garrett Crochet because of me, one specific thing, well, two specific things. His fastball and his slider appear to be close to major league ready. That, to me, not necessarily the comp to Chris Sale and that, oh, he could become a Hall of Fame pitcher – it's the comp to Chris Sale 10 years ago when everyone said, hey, wait a minute, this guy's stuff plays as a reliever almost right now. Is he going to figure out the changeup? We don't know. Maybe he will. And it took a couple years. It was 2012 when Sale transitioned to a starter. And if you go back and look at it, that's really when his changeup came together at the major league level. That's when he developed that third pitch to be a starter. I'm fascinated by this because – all these kids who got drafted tonight, we don't know where they're going. We don't know if they have any development, place to develop this year. But if you have a guy who's got a major league fastball and a major league slider, maybe you throw him on this so-called taxi squad we're going to see, and he'd help, he's getting development right now with, with these guys, with the White Sox this year. It's all hypothetical at this point, but that's why I like the direction the Sox went in in this specific draft. A couple of things. First, I want to say when we're talking about – talking about a guy one night and then maybe forgetting about him. Boy, does that tell you how far the White Sox have come in two years, right? Because no one forgot about Nick Madrigal. No one forgot about Andrew Vaughn. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, one year after they make the number three pick in the draft, we're talking about a guy, oh, you know, okay, oh, well, we'll see. Uh, That shows that, you know, as as the, uh, the mode changes from rebuilding to contending, you stop making those draft picks where the guy that you pick in the top five is going to be a big part of your team an everyday player for your team moving forward the second thing I'll say is yeah we heard a lot of things tonight they talked about it on MLB Network right after uh, Crochet was drafted about could he follow that Chris Sale model which by the way applies to other guys too like Mark Burley and Carlos Rodon 
put him in the bullpen and then he becomes a starter, get him up right away, get him up quick. The thing I have to say is we don't know what this major league season is going to look like either. And so you say, Hey, give him a chance to put him on the next. I mean, the guy had made one start even collegiately since the end of his sophomore year, uh, you know, last summer, uh, this time last year. So uh, obviously he played in the fall and other stuff like that, but on the biggest stage that he possibly could. So it, it's a very, uh, you got to look at Rick Hahn and the way that he's brought along all these prospects very patiently. And yeah, they're going into a change now. Maybe they want a guy who can help them immediately in terms of contending. But at the same time, Rick Hahn's always talking about, it, even as he's made all these free agent acquisitions, how they have to plan for 10 years down the line. And I don't think that in a season where they might only play 48 games, they're going to uh, you know start the clock on a guy who's only made one start since last summer. And not to mention, he said, you, you, Adam talked about development too, about this year. He has had zero development at all at the collegiate level. Usually these guys who get thrown into major league bullpens are coming off of a college world series or something in mid July, you know, late June, early July. And they're just kind of thrust into a pennant race. And it like, there's like no time off. He basically has been off since everybody else has is complete has completely wiped out his college season. I'm thinking more along the lines of that taxi squad, Adam, that you mentioned. I think that that makes a lot of sense just to get his work in for 2020 and that maybe that that short, that relief mode, to see where you're at in 2021. Whatever this season is going to be in 2020, you kind of wipe him off the map almost because I'm not sure in a 48 to 72 to 76 game season, if you're counting on him, you're probably not in the playoff hunt anyway. In my opinion, I doubt he's going to be with the team in 2020 major leagues. No yeah. way. I just think that's way too much, but Hey, uh, I'll say this about him. He's Chicago tough. Oh, is he Chicago tough? He was hit by a line drive going up against Mississippi. He needed emergency jaw surgery. He came back two weeks later, pitched two and a third inning scoreless in a big game and it was an NCAA regional game. So uh, I think they like – actually, I know. I was talking to someone with the Sox. They say they love his competitiveness. And there's been some thoughts about him being a, a bullpen guy. And this person I was speaking with saying, you know, that's obviously – you know what uh, I think was Mike Shirley on the conference call with us said his floor in his mind is ninth inning, closer, ceiling, a number three starter, maybe even higher. I think you're always going to get – aren't you always going to get the scouting director to give you – like, to me, if he's a lights-out closer for five seasons, that's – and he's an all-star for two or three of them, great pick. Yeah. I mean, I don't – he said it with the ceiling is a number three starter. Okay, like, I'm buying. I'm buying. But I, I, the floor-ceiling stuff from a, from, a, from a scouting director is going to be basically ceiling-ceiling. That's the way I look at it because he can't possibly tell you, well, he could flame out and be Carson Fulmer, you know, like you don't want to hear that. And he's certainly not going to say it. And he's definitely not going to say it with the guy on the line. I, it's his first pick and, and I get it. So. Well, and that's what too, what I was thinking when we we're throwing around the comps to Chris sale. Yeah. It sounds a little ridiculous, but what they're going to comp him to a guy who <laughs> never made the major leagues. Like obviously right. they're going to comp him to somebody who has succeeded at the major league level. So yeah, you hear that and it sounds ridiculous, but you could go through everybody who was picked in the first round tonight and you're going to get a comp that is going to be to a good major league baseball player. I know I was going to say something, but I will say this. There was a pick at 14 by the Rangers. I can't remember specifically who it was the second baseman from Mississippi state. And his comps weren't Chris Sale. They, they were more like Logan Forsyth, and I can't remember the other one. That's like not a, good first-round comps. A good 20 – no, a 26-man type guy. And I'm like, okay, good for MLB Network for not giving us, like, Ian Kinsler and – you know, Jose Altuve. Yeah, yeah. There, there was another one in the top ten that was, like, a taller Andrew Benintendi, I think, which <laughs> – it's like it's okay. not a bar to clear in terms of height. No <laughs> yeah, pun intended. You're right. I'm like, <laughs> okay, he, so then he's I'm not getting too ex <laughs> I'm not getting too excited about that one. I I mean, um, look, I, I again with the with the Chris Sale thing. To me, it's less about 
comparing him to the to the guy Chris Sale's obviously become and more to the pitcher that Chris Sale was when he was drafted and the possible development. Obviously, there's a ton of variables here that as we continue to do these podcasts and every time we write, it's frustrating not to know what this season is going to look like. I, I think that to a certain extent, these teams, front offices, minor league directors, they're, they're frustrated too because they don't know – what the heck to do with all these prospects that they've invested so much time and money in uh, and, and how to keep this development going. I mean, this is a story we're going to be talking about for years. It, 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 you know, a couple of years from now, it's going to be some players like, well, you know, he, everybody lost that 2020 season. How did that impact him? So again, I just, I hope that whatever this looks like, I like the fact that the guy the Sox picked tonight already appears to have at least two pitches that can play close to the major league level. That puts him in a position that I think he doesn't have to worry about. It, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think it, I think it is, it was a smart play for the Sox in 2020. They're already comparing this draft, even though it just happened to the talent level of 2011 and if you look at the 2011's draft, it's one of the best in the history of baseball. You had Garrett Cole, Trevor Bauer, Francisco Lindor, Anthony Rendon, Javi Baez, George Springer, Jose Fernandez. It just went on and on. Sonny Gray, Trevor Story, and Blake Snell. We'll see what it ends up becoming, but you know, I think that's encouraging whatever team you are because – that's how talented, at least what these scouts are saying, what these GMs are saying, is that this, this could be a very, very special draft. So we'll see what happens. I um, think, though, I think, though, real quickly, is playing in, I'm more kind of with Adam on this because I, while, look, these guys spend their entire lives dissecting talent and in, in 10 years, these guys are bigger, faster, stronger than 2011. But uh, as a, if you're a Sox fan, I think you, I'd be a little more nervous if the White Sox were picking two, three, or four this year than picking 11. Just because this whole 2020 situation of you don't – like where – what could have been with Garrett Crochet in 2020? He may have been in the top five. He may have flamed out and not even been a first-round pick just because of his 2020 season. It could have been like Alec Hansen type. You don't know. Just because of his 2020 season and what was lost. And while the talent – might be there and we know like what these guys have done in you know, all the way up through all these you know private workouts and camps and then in college seasons and high schools and all, all that stuff to have your senior season like completely wiped off or junior season wiped out you know I don't know like it it'll I think Adam's right two three four five years from now you're going to be talking about oh that guy was picked in 2020 and the reason is we can always go back to the COVID-19 situation I, I think it's something to look at I feel so good I about kind guys, of stashing Garrett Crochet. I want to get your guys' thoughts on Ed Howard. He's from Linwood, went to Mount Carmel, went through the White Sox ace program. What a great story he would have been if the White Sox had drafted him. I did not want him to go to the Cubs, and yet the Cubs drafted him. Uh, clearly, he's a shortstop. Tim Anderson is his mentor. Do you, you, know, they, you, you draft the best player available he is a shortstop what do you guys think about the Cubs getting him and would you have liked to see the Sox draft him yeah this was uh, something I was worried about tonight because you know based on everything I read going into the draft it seemed like it would have been a little bit of a stretch at number 11 to take Ed Howard and I think all those things we just talked about too taking a high school kid this year is risky to me um but with that connection with the White Sox and being a Mount Carmel uh, coming up through the ACE program, it would have been an unbelievable story. And so now he's, he's on the north side. And I actually got asked this question today by David Hall on Sports Talk Live. You know, how would I feel if Ed Howard ended up on the Cubs? And, you know, it kind of depended on who the White Sox drafted. And if the White Sox had drafted a different high school kid, I think this would be harder to swallow. 
but they, they appear to have drafted a pitcher that's close to major league ready, and they're in a different situation than the Cubs right now. So I don't think I'm going to be too upset about the results. However, I think we can all agree the four of us in White Sox fans everywhere are always going to keep half an eye on Ed Howard's development. And of course, we've all talked to David Kaplan about this before. He gets upset about Eloy Jimenez. His response was this would be payback for the Eloy trade. I think that's a stretch and connecting stretch. some really weird dots. Um, but, you know, the Cubs are looking for their payback. So if they end up, if Ed Howard ends up becoming, you know, a perennial all star on the north side, it's going to be a, a talking point in this city. Well, for what, a very what's long to time. be upset about, right? I mean, you got the, sto- you got the story. The Chicago kid stays in Chicago. That's the story. And I've, so I think you're still seeing the benefit of that, um, even though he's on the other side of town. Yes, I know. Sox fans love the Cubs, whatever. But I mean, you've got a guy who's getting to play in his hometown and getting to serve as an example. Uh, as, as I believe Tim Anderson said on, on Twitter, uh, that's going to be able to serve as an example and an inspiration for a lot of kids in this city, and he's still going to be able to do it in his hometown, and I think that's really, really good. It's the best story of the night. Any team, any city, that the Cubs drafted at Howard, in my opinion. If you're watching MLB Network and Howard, uh, Harold Reynolds, Howard and Harold, uh, Harold Reynolds discussing the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement tonight with Major League Baseball, and how Theo Epstein was actually the guy who led the charge and in three days was able to get all 30 teams, all 30 teams on board tonight and get the donations to, I think, four or five different organizations because Theo rode his bike to a rally on Thursday and was so blown away by this generation that he felt compelled that he needed to do something in the immediate. And then to draft a player – that quite frankly hasn't looked like a Cubs player uh, in the last in every draft that the UF scene's been a part of since 2012. It's the best story of the night, and I think it needs to be played up. And I know we're doing a White Sox podcast, but because you mentioned the the questions about Ed Howard and the White Sox raising him, so to speak, because that's what they do in the ace, in the ace program. Like you can't tell that story enough how good the ace program is. Every White Sox fan should be rooting for Ed Howard on the north side. Every baseball fan should. The fact that he's in Chicago is awesome. It might suck and pain you a little bit, but it's an awesome story. All right, so I reached out to Tim Anderson, asked him what he thought about Ed going to the Cubs, and he said, it's all love. He's going to be a piece that's needed in Chicago to inspire as well. So um, go ahead, Adam. And I'll – Oh, yeah, along those lines of what Guff just said and Tim Anderson's response, you know, everything – I think we all really appreciate what Tim Anderson's message has been over the last couple seasons. And it's obvious when you see a kid like Ed Howard who's looking up to Tim Anderson that it matters. You know, it really matters for, for baseball everywhere, but especially here in the city. Um, and so I think it's cool. You know, it would have been great if he had been on the Sox, but it, it's also cool that now there's someone on the North side that can kind of partner up with Tim Anderson and continue to push these outstanding messages. And now there's more, uh, there's another athlete in the city that young Chicago kids can look up to. Um, and, and I think that that's great. And plus, you know, storylines, I am all for the White Sox-Cubs rivalry taking off any angle that we can get back in this thing. I mean, last year was huge with Eloy hitting that home run at Wrigley. I hope that just continues to build and build and to add to the rivalry. I mean, real quick on the Ed Howard thing, too. Because of where Tim Anderson – Ed Howard's four or five years away, probably. I mean, he's 18 years old. So let's be realistic. It's almost going to be kind of like a passing of the baton at that point. Like, Tim Anderson's going to be a 10-year vet or an eight to a nine year vet when Ed Howard makes his debut, you're going to have this guy who's made his impact in the city for 10, for eight, nine, 10 years. And has kind of shown the way he's not going to stop mentoring Ed Howard. He's still here. His family's here. This is where he's born and raised. He came up through the white Sox ace program. I'm with you. Like, like what a great, like for both sides of town to have a guy you can turn to awesome. And I kind of like that kind of the, 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 the changing of the guard. And maybe that maybe you're just passing the baton back and forth or, or no one's passing it. Maybe it's just everyone's holding on to it. It's awesome. 
All right, so the big news that happened right before the draft was Rob Manfred going on ESPN, and he said, we're going to play baseball in 2020 100%. Now, Guff is nodding his head no. I don't know why you're doing that. Um, I think I know why you're doing that. You just think that, well, here's the deal. We're going to know by next week or sooner when this season is going to start. Uh, because here's the deal. The two sides can't come to an agreement. Manfred has the power to step in and implement this shorter season of like what, 48, 50 games. So here's the deal. We're going to get a baseball season. That's the best news. The bad news is it could just only be a 48 game season. Who wants to take it from here? I mean, the fact that he, but he still called out the players in that statement. Like you left out the part where like well, he's, well, he's, he's fighting them. That's, that's why he called them out. I, what a surprise, right? <laughs> I can't believe Gary Bettman's a better commissioner right now in sports than, than Rob Manfred. I really can't believe it. It makes me so pissed off to even fathom that situation. And the baseball's already lost to me. Baseball's yeah. already lost. And even though they play 70 games, there's a, you had an opportunity to take, to grab people you're not going to grab next year. You know, you're just, it's just, it's just frustrating. And I get it. I know what side he's got to take, but he just didn't, there was, it just didn't feel very, I don't know. I probably would have handled it differently. I'll put it that way. It's It's not a we right now. It's an us and a them. It's not we. And and that's why this was a big yawn for me tonight. What, what, what he said, Uh, we already knew he had that power and it was the, the only thing that would be worse than that playing out where Manfred essentially has to force everyone to come play baseball for 50 games um, would be him just like punting on the season, which I guess he would have the power to do. Right. That would just be like an abomination. um, If you had the power to make him play and didn't, but you're still like just one step above that is, Oh, no one really wants to make this work. So I'm going to force everyone to get out there. And I think that would be just a horrible situation to watch, to cover, you're going to have players reluctantly out there. Um, if someone gets a hamstring pull in the second week of the season, they're not going to be motivated to come back, it, especially depending on who it is. They're, they could be a free agent coming up this year. I just think that that would be an awful thing to play out, and it cannot come down to that. So I, for him to just say this tonight, don't care. Get up there and tell me you're going to work out a deal with the players. Get get. get Give me any sense of idea that you're actually trying to do what's best for the fans and play more games. That would have been a cool statement. That would have been a cool way to start the draft. Telling me, oh, I will use my executive power to make these guys play 50 games. Get, I don't care about that. Preach! Come on, Adam. Don't stop. That's, that's, all, that's all very nice, except that Rob Manfred's job is not to do what's best for the fans. Rob Manfred's job is to do what's best for the 30 team owners. Just like Tony Clark's job is not to do what's best for the fans, it's to do what's best for the players. And so that's the situation you've got going. Plus, remember, we're still playing, still got a pandemic going on outside, though you wouldn't have known, that from, watch, wouldn't have known that from watching the draft. How have we gotten 30 minutes in and brought, <laughs> brought up the fact there are draft parties all around the globe that we're yeah, uh, not, a mask, not a mask in sight? Well, this I, is I didn't true, understand. This is a true story. My five-year-old asked me in the middle of watching like the first five picks if the sickness was over. He asked me that question Smart because he, he recognized the difference of watching this draft compared to the NFL draft in which – after the first night, because there was a little bit of an issue, people not wearing masks. They wore masks the rest of the time, and it was it was like a mandate sent down. Tonight, it was just like, oh, everything's over. And I thought that was a terrible message to send. Shocking, shocking that Texas, Florida, California, and uh, where's the other? Oh, George, where's the other spike right now? Arizona. Shocking. That those are the four states that have a spike. I bet you none of them will be coming from those houses tonight that we saw. What the hell was going on? Well, Ed Howard was, what, at a bar in Indiana? That was frustrating. That, that was, was – uh, a lot of people in there and no masks. No nothing. Way, no, spe- no social distancing. I neon light in the back. I saw a neon light in the back of that, that bar that said Wrigleyville, and it made me kind of – be like, wait. But I'm guessing it's just, co- like, coincidence. So – Back to the season happening, I have a feeling (laughs) – There, maybe it'll happen. I have a feeling – correct me. Maybe you guys feel differently. I have a feeling we're going to see a deal that is 
that 48, 50 game regular season and then big playoffs because that's where all the TV money comes from. That's and bad. so if that's fine to have that opinion. I'm just saying when you look at what's worth the most money, it's that postseason TV contract. And so when you've got them throwing out the idea of having 16 teams in the playoffs, like this is the NBA, that might not sit well with a lot of baseball fans, but it means a lot more playoff games to get them a lot more money in a season where they're not going to have a lot of opportunity to make you know, a lot of money. I'm going to try to just jump ahead. Now, granted, we're in this moment right now, and the idea of a 50-game season or 48 just sounds awful. Season goes, the White Sox are playing well. If they make the playoffs, we're going to forget about whether it's 50 games or 70 games. We'll be just happy they made the playoffs. That's how I think it'll be. As the eighth seed? Yeah. You know, the only time you won't be happy, Chuck, it'll be weird because I agree with what Paul Canerico told you the other day. If the White Sox were to, like, catch lightning in a bottle and win it all, it'll, it'll be as asterisk as asterisk has ever been. And hang it up there with all the other questionable stuff that's happened in baseball. But to me, it's more – and I, I agree that'll be a thing. What's so stupid about the idea of a 50-game season – so when does that start? The middle of August? No, it's like okay. early August, probably. Great. So now you went from an opportunity where you could have been the first sport back. Yep. To owning the sports world. Now it's the middle of August. The yep. NBA is back. They're in a playoff tournament. The NHL is back. They're in a playoff. T- Already we know that MLS, with actually a somewhat cool World Cup style tournament, is coming back before baseball will, even if baseball gets back by July 10th. PGA is back. PGA. Golf is already back. NASCAR. NASCAR's been back. Like, but, you're just but, a thing. But it's to me, the, baseball's the, on. The, the biggest two competitors, though, to me, are the NBA and the NFL because you've totally already agree. fallen behind them. You've already yeah. fallen behind them. So you had an opportunity to grab the spotlight back a little bit. And instead, you're talking about coming back with this, quite frankly, half ass season, 50 games competing directly against NBA playoffs. And, oh, by the way, NFL training camp preseason's already going to be going by then. We're going to be three weeks from the start of the NFL season starting. This season, whether games get played or not, will be a wash. And it Guys, let me just say this, game. though. I mean, I and I, Major League Baseball's got its issues. But if the NBA and the NHL were in the same boat, where, say, the pandemic hit in October – they would be struggling trying to figure out the finances for a whole they would season. Been, they wouldn't. They wouldn't because they have a salary cap. Yeah, and that's they, what this they, whole they, that's what this whole fine. argument is about. Because the players don't they they see these measures as Correct. something that is going to lead to a salary cap in baseball, and that's what they're fighting. Because right now, this delay, this shortened season is only now partially caused by the pandemic because they have been fighting over this for so long. Now, listen, you can think that it might not be a good idea to play at all. And we're going to see when the NBA comes back and when the NHL comes back and when the, and when baseball comes back, whether it was a good idea to do this or not. But the reason that they're doing it so late in the calendar is now only partially because of the pandemic. Well, one thing that Canerco, uh, when I was talking with Canerco, one thing with, to add on to what you said, Guff, in 1981, when there was the strike shortened season, you had two halves. And teams would have, there are many teams that made the playoffs that were crappy for the first 50 games, but then were great for the other 50. So teams made the playoffs like the Dodgers, who had one good half of 50 games, they won the World Series. No one has looked at the Dodgers from 81 and said that was not a real championship. Over time, I think, and this is what Canerco was thinking, whoever wins this championship, say in 10 years, they're not going to have an asterisk. But it's going to be a huge talking point well, for sure for about a year or the, two. The, the difference was there was one game on a week. There was no Twitter. There was, you know, the L.A. Times, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune. You're right. But this will always be more talked about than 1981 just because of where we're at with media. Yeah. I mean, it's just – Adam nailed it. I, I, give me the combo of what Adam said and Vinny. Get into August, honestly, let's just, let's just call it what it is, a wash. Because there was nothing more American than having baseball opening day on July 4th. You had the war. You literally could have taken this thing and ran with it for three and a half weeks before the NBA even showed up. And instead, 
you could have had this, here we are in the middle of summer in this pandemic that hopefully we'll never have to go through again on like you're at your peak and baseball's back, you know, and start it like Cubs, Cardinals, White Sox, Twins, like give us all, like make the schedule like just where you're going to be like, you're going to be looking right and left and going, I want all of it. And instead we're sitting here fighting because if they, if this CBA wasn't coming up at the end of 2021, we wouldn't even be talking about this. The day would be set. Baseball would be back. If, the, if there was a CBA through 2026, but this is all about, this is like a chess game. It's all, it's all a bunch of pawns trying to find their way to the king and queen so we can make our, everyone can have a say at the, what happens in December of 2021. This and is just a perfect, it, listen, this, this, this transpired to be the worst perfect storm of, you know, crap. Just, you could just talk about pandemic, when it hit collective bargaining agreement happen, a march a march uh, accord these guys made with each other and they don't even they came and agree on yeah. what they agreed upon so a lot of things were at play but, here and for and for a sport that didn't for a sport that couldn't afford it let's put it that way but two months ago we were talking about how with all that being said it could have the silver lining was the opportunity for baseball they just blew that they blew it they absolutely blew it. It's already over. I mean, they blew that part of it. It, it cannot be salvaged. And that's, to, to me, as a lifelong baseball fan, it just makes me so angry. Well, listen, like, if they in. can figure things out and get on the field in the middle of July, at least get some of July where they're the story, I think that's going to help them. I, we're not out of the woods I, on that yet. The last thing I'll say, and I, I hope they get to 72 games, 76 games, whatever, but w- the four of us, we're in. Like, so, like even if we're mad about it, you know, like you throw the worm in the water and I'm swimming and I'm biting the same hook every time because I love baseball. You got me. I don't care. Like, I want my son to be in, you know? I want, like, Adam's son to be in. Vinny's future son to be Like, I want I want that generation of kids. Like, I really do. Like, I, speaking of baton handoffs, there's no person to hand the baton off to right now for baseball fans. That's a problem, you know? And that's why they, this could have mattered. Like we could be sitting down watching games with our kids right now that we've never been able to do because of the situation we're in. And instead everyone's just, uh, it's uh, whatever. It's it's okay to be, I'm sweating now. It's almost 10 o'clock central time. I'm sweating. (laughs) Well, I will say that once baseball starts, if you know, yeah, there's going to be some competition, but, I refuse to believe it's a wash, like you said, Guff. I don't think it's a wash if they come back and play 50 games and there's a postseason. I'll be in. Well, it's my job, but I love it. So I, I just want a baseball season at this point. There was a chance that we were going to get a baseball season. Give me freaking according to the, baseball. According to the commissioner, there's a 100% chance you're going to get a baseball season. Then we're getting season, baseball. Man, I'll I don't tell you care. what. Then how come, this, how come this conversation has been so dour? I've been trying <laughs> to be the most positive person here, but Guff and Adam Hogue want to jump off a cliff. <laughs> We're gonna jump off a cliff. We're just telling you how people like it, that's real stuff, man. I know it's real, but hey, I I think it's pretty hey, cool. We fought my kids in baseball. In all seriousness, if it does come down to just 15 games, at that point to me, and I don't think it's gonna happen, it's just an idea. I think at that point they should come up with something that's different more, like different. Yeah, they should just play that giant playoff thing that Passing came up with two months ago. Yeah, I no, agree. I, I'm I agree. with it. Or, or like, just play it, like, almost make your divisions round robin and come out yeah, with a division I, I winner. I agree with that. And, totally you know, agree. You, it's 50 games. It's just – Because, like, what – like, are you going to be ecstatic when your 26 and 24 team comes, like, right. trodden in as the 12 seed and then, like, all of a sudden you're in the ALCS because – There were not a lot of teams that finished 500 last year. I know. And if there's a 16-team playoff field, you will be getting sub-500 teams in the playoffs. Like, guys, it's gonna be really- it, guys, I'll just tell you, I lived this. In 1981, this is what happened. Look it up. <laughs> Teams <laughs> played 50 games and they got in the my, playoffs. I'll get on my encyclopedia. I right. mean, it, it was, you know, that's what happened. Let's put, let's put on some Pretenders albums and go back to 1981. <laughs> 81. Start me up, Rolling Stones. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, hopefully next week we're doing a podcast talking about a new season, 70-something games. And if not, it's 50, and we'll deal with it. Sound good? 
you know, we, we've done some optimistic podcasts, so we were due for a, a pessimistic one. <laughs> it's okay. Big, big apology to Garrett Crochet, whose parade is getting rained <laughs> yeah. on big time. I know. Everyone's talking about Ed Howard, no baseball season. Come on, we got, we got Chris Sale. We got the new Chris Sale coming to the south side. It's not I mean. so bad. And if not, he's Andrew Miller. All right, that's a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Win Trust, your home for White Sox. Check in with three ATMs nationwide. Go to your special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash socks. My thanks to Adam Hogue, Ryan McGuff, Vinny Duber, Hawk Harrelson. Take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.